Today, I'm coming to you not from downtown San Antonio. I'm coming to you from Musical Arts Center of San Antonio. Stick around. We're going to get a tour and an interview. Hi, Ted Barshley with Alamo Piano Galleries. Today, I'm here with... Ken Thompson uh, from Maxa Musical Arts Center of San Antonio. I'm the CEO and founder of Maxa. This is going to be a wonderful, great conversation. I've been looking forward to this. Matter of fact, I haven't had a serious conversation with Ken in 24 years, I think we figured it out. It was about I think it's been 24 years. It's somewhere around there. And what I wanted to tell you, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, this interview is going to make you want to get all your friends to subscribe. Ken's a great guy. He's built a phenomenal school here, but it started 24 years ago. 24 years ago, that's right. And actually, yeah. Go ahead. Well, yeah. No, I was Tell the story it, of how it, we it, first um, met. Sure, sure, sure. Well, actually, um, we have had several conversations, but just they were all fun conversations, which hopefully this will also be fun. It's supposed to um, be. It will definitely be fun, but we haven't really had a chance to um, talk at this level and really have a longer conversation. And and then I actually didn't realize you hadn't been out here before, so that was super cool to show you around. That was yeah. our oversight because I'm thinking, you know, we've done interviews, we've done a lot of stuff. Sure, Ken has been out there, and this is the bottom line. Just after 20 plus years, you got over 43 teachers, over 1,100 students, mm -hmm. and so many people are just making major advances in their mm -hmm. piano career, their musical mm -hmm. journeys, whether it's not just piano, you teach everything out right. there. And it, it's like, how have we never gone out there other than <laughs> to just try to see if there's any need for product? Right. And, and right. product need, I don't even know we're going to talk a lot about that. Sure. This would be a good time for you to say, this is what I want. And get right. it on video and then, you know, get a little arm twist and go. No, but the bottom line is, man, when you first came in, I was uh -huh. amazed when you said, Ted, there's like hundreds, if not at least mm -hmm. thousands of students that are not getting even the opportunity right. to be taught piano the mm -hmm. right way. Right, right. And right. this was when, at the time, I think Max had the guy in the mirror that you saw as mm -hmm. the dream for building this place. Tell me, right. tell me what your original... Well, thank you for that. Yeah, so I... Um, uh, I guess what it, part of what it was is I was trying to find um, an alternative for, uh, to teaching at a university. Um, and I had also, when I had gone to school in, uh, up at Eastman in Rochester, there was a school there called the Hochstein School of Music. It's still there. They're doing great. A nonprofit school. And that just kind of stuck in my head. Something about that place stuck in my head. I like the feel of it. I like that there were all these um, young people there learning music. And it was kind of refreshing going from the conservatory, like when I would go uh, and just kind of drop in there, the conservatory, which was very tough. Uh, so a place where people are having fun, you know, learning music and learning it very, very well. So it just kind of stuck in my mind. And I used to perform a lot, uh, but I was kind of realizing that my strengths, that I actually what I realized was that my strengths were more directed towards teaching. And I, and I really loved teaching. Like I, ha I had no real awareness of how uh, much I love teaching, and so I really got into it, and I found I loved it more and more. So, um, so then I, but I had all this creative energy when I wasn't performing concerts anymore, and I started to formulate this idea of like I think I could build a music school, you know. And it took way longer to do than I anticipated. I spent seven years planning it. So it opened in '99, but it was in the early '90s I started working on it, and. Um, Anyway, but it was, I was thinking if, if I had um, an alternative to teaching at a university for uh, people, that that would be a real benefit to the musical community. I, there was a particular student, actually, uh, Christopher Guzman, who's uh, a phenomenal pianist. He's now teaching at Northwestern University. Um, he was kind of my, uh, another influence at the time. He was a young prodigy, basically, uh, doing amazing things. And I, I was aware that we always give so much support to these prodigies, you know, and everybody's like, Here some, here's a tuxedo, here's a concert, here's some money. And then what happens when they get older and they graduate is we're on to the next prodigy and we're not really taking care of them, you know, in their livelihoods. So the core um, building block of Maxa was to create a careers for gifted teachers that wanted to continue to get better at teaching. Right. That was the core. If you start with that core, you're going to have students. Students are going to, are going to stick to, and they'll come from miles around 
to study with the great, great teachers. So that was always based on that idea of great teachers and, um, and also giving an opportunity to, an alternative to teaching, you know, like at a college or something like that. Right. Yeah. So. Well, you had mentioned that out of every single college mm -hmm. hire job, like, hey, right. you're a piano professor. There's like right. 50, 60, 80 people. Oh, it'll be, no, it'll even be, hundreds. now it's 150 people the doctor is applying for one gig. You so know, the other huge. 149, right. maybe you assume half of them live in your region. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and so you, we were think, I was thinking, you know, well, why not um, that build, build this on the like top half of those people that didn't get the university job. Right. Uh, because there's, those are great people. And, and, it, and it's actually, I've also been a, bit, a real advocate for uh, the joys of classical music, you know, in the world. Right? right. So like, well, how are you, in America, how are you going to support people best? And it's complicated. But one thing that I saw that I could do was to make parents not quite so freaked out when their kids say they want to major in music. If I could show them a path, okay, well, you can come back, you can teach, you can perform, but this could be your uh, living, you know, to teach, right. teach here. And, um, um, and that's, that's what we did. So our whole structure, our whole internal structure is based on um, trying to pay the teachers as much as we possibly can um, so that they can make a living and, um, you know, and inspire thrive. new, yeah. new generation. Right. Exactly. It's, it's supposed to be a, you know, a, a synergistic kind of a thing. What, yeah. what yeah. percentage in the school is, is piano? Oh gosh. About a good 80%. 80%. So, yeah. Big time. Yeah. So then you also have violin and yeah. guitar and classical. It's basically piano. about 80% piano, about 15% voice. We have a, our voice department's really gotten tremendously strong over the last few years. We have about uh, eight, phenomenal voice teachers right now. Um, and then we have some really fine string teachers as well, but it's primarily um, piano and voice. Piano and, and we have a guitar teacher who's very, very fine, um, Tom Vela. Um, so the thing is that a part of that is because of my background in, is in piano and I have, um, I can, I can evaluate teachers better and help them. Correct. That, you know, you know what I mean? Right. Like, like if I, if, I guess if you were a chef and you were running a teaching restaurant in a sense, uh, whatever your specialty would be, you tend to be better at. You know what I right. mean. So that's kind of kind right. of what I'm saying with that. Um, so do you have what's what's the age breakdown? Is there oh, is there the like um, some of the beginners? Like how many? What percentage of beginners of your total uh -huh. student is like what 40, 50 percent or young? I would beginners? say it's probably that. Yeah, I mean we have a large group of kids that are um, pre preschool kids. Uh, ben, Brenda Boyce is an absolutely amazing preschool teacher. Um, she does nothing but young kids and right. has for like 35 years and does amazing at that. But we have, you know, Vita Scott, I could keep naming. Now I'm, now I'm wanting to name everybody because right. I don't want people to get mad at me. But, um, but the thing is that um, we have quite a, a lot that are in that younger group. We have about 112, 120 adult students too, okay. uh, which I think, so we have like this two extremes. Right. And um, then I do a pretty good job of um, stimulating the high school level students. We, we do all these events and, uh, and performances and things to kind of continue to keep students engaged. You have to have that in order for, because like what's cool when you're 10 to do is not cool when you're 15. Right. right. So we have, we have these things that get tougher you know. The student you know, has to be uh, pushed to desire right. that, that more attention right. or, or the ability. Uh -huh. You want to make that student so they want to go up there right. and perform it for right. people. Like, wait, right. wait till you see me perform. Right, right. That, 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 intrinsic, that, right. that is a different mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. motivational teaching right. as opposed right. to just follow the rules and learn it. Right, right. Yeah, that, fire that, that, someone up. No, that is exactly right. That firing up is critical. Yeah. So, so that, that internal motivation, but you can create an environment where that internal motivation is more likely to thrive. Right, you know? right. And that's, that's the idea. We, try, we do that. We work towards that with all this stuff that we're doing. And we try to do really different creative things. We just had Dennis Alexander here, which is really awesome. Uh, he's a you know, uh, phenomenal composer, oh, he pianist. A, you just he, had a great oh, opportunity a to talk with him. Great conversation. Um, and um, so we, we, and then we're doing a, a, special, a new event for uh, things we're calling Hidden Gems. Like, Pieces that I, we haven't exactly figured out the rules for it yet, but the idea is things that are not that are hard to find on YouTube. You know, enter one of the pieces has to be one of, something like that, something that's that's off the beaten path. I love the Alamo Music Center playful piano competition idea. Like that's a great idea. Stuff like that, we need that. We also need the formal, like you know, the stuff that I'm actually better at. I'm actually better at that formal kind of formal that, recitals. The formal recitals, that whole like you know kind of thing. That's actually my wheelhouse, but. But what I've learned is you, you, you can't, uh, you must break the rules. 
You right. say to stay relevant, and you have to engage people where they are. Where they are, and it's for some of those people that they'll, they'll want to do those more formal things. But you have to still give them all these outlets for their creativity, and it has to be safe for them, and interesting for them, and relevant to them. This is beyond like the first you know couple of years of lessons, right? Right. right. No, this but is. But this is why we have that long hold, typically. You know, right? Because of that, we're trying to motivate them. Well, performance yeah. is a major, major thing of music because mm -hmm. I mean, the whole purpose of music is to bring it to others. Yeah. And some yeah. people, when they learn it, they find out that they're extremely introverted and mm -hmm. they don't really like performing for mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes you have to like, well, why is that? Well, mm -hmm. I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake and right. laugh at me. Well, if you're a comedy act, that's your target. But well, that's true. none of us are, okay? <laughs> that's but true. At, at the same yeah. time, yeah. I learned, you're probably going to understand mm -hmm. this, I learned one of the most valuable lessons about performing mm -hmm. from a baton twirler. Oh. When I was in seventh grade, and she I'm was an eighth grade baton okay. twirler. <laughs> and we were at lunch, and someone said, Don't you get nervous before you go mm. out there in front of a, the football game? Right. Everyone on earth that knows you, your family, and mm. everyone else, mm. and you're twirling the mm -hmm. baton, aren't you afraid you're going to drop it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she didn't even bet. I said, No, we know we're going to drop it when we go out there. Right. You just have to be graceful and keep going. Right, 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 right. Man, the baton twirlers, they don't wear a whole lot of clothes at that age. They're yeah. out there in a little skimpy chair. Right. Or, right. You know, and they're tossing that thing around, knowing they're going to have to pick it up. It's like, that's so much easier. I mean, so much harder than mm -hmm. sitting down and playing piano and making mm -hmm. a mistake. Mm -hmm. And that's all performance is. The piano players get really hung up about having that's an true. audience. That's we have people come in the store don't want to play in front of anyone. Mm -hmm. Well, can mm -hmm. you play it for me? He's like, sure. But, you know, mm -hmm. but what's there to be afraid of or shy of? Mm -hmm. So then I realized it's all in your head. Oh, it's totally. And once yeah. once someone yeah. understands that, mm -hmm. that fire to perform mm -hmm. is just lit up and they've realized, right. you know, it's right. And mm -hmm. if you make a mistake, don't draw any attention to it. Hardest right. thing about that playing is piano yeah. is playing through your mistakes. <clears throat> that's right. I don't that's know right. anyone ever that's gone out there and said, I made the, fl the best <laughs> flawless perform. Everyone mm -hmm. has a flub. Oh, yeah. Even if, the, even if the key doesn't sound. Right. You right. saw right. it go down right. in your epistle. Right. Oh, man, you're going to screw right. it. And right. it goes through your head. Right. Right. That's right. the strange part about performing is that the biggest challenge is like in golf, it's yourself. Ah, right. <laughs> well, and yeah, it, and that's true. And that's one of the things like in golf, golf is a good example because that you're, you're playing, uh, you know, essentially on your own, even though you're with other people, right? right. It is. A, it, and I think that, uh, yeah, for, uh, there are, there are many opportunities to, to grow yourself as a person when you're working on something like golf or something like uh, music, piano, uh, where you're where you're confronting your demons in a sense, right? right? right. Your insecurities, um, and it's very uncomfortable. That's that's actually part of what's so hard. Actually, that's why we have to have all these motivational things. And that's what's hard with adult students is the adult students are used to being great at things. They're used to being able to drive a car. They can you know buy groceries. They can do all these things that and they have may have these big jobs. The task. They're not right, and so now. When you're an adult student, suddenly you're like, oh, wait, this is hard. This looks so easy. It makes it look so, but it's really hard. And they have to confront that again. However, well, because when you're seven, you're not, you're every, you're not good at anything, right? You're just used to being right. that way, right? You know, you're, like, I'm, I'm seven. Hey, come on. But when you're, um, you know, 47, you know, you start to be way more self-conscious. But the thing is that that's a real um, danger in terms of your long-term success. You need to be uh, shattering your um, ego in some ways, right? And confronting it and m moving through those things. And a really good teacher, an understanding teacher will help you to grow, right? Through those rough spots. And then when you go back to your career, you're not just in a rigid thing. I mean, m most of the great innovations are gonna come from not doing the same thing all the time. Right. You have to keep your mind flexible. Right, right. So and maintain really balance. Important. That's the other mm -hmm. thing too, like mm -hmm. you said, shadowing your your and confronting your fears it's hard to do that and maintain your balance especially right if performing is like you're about to you know skydive you're about to jump out right of the plane for the <laughs> bungee jump for the first yes time. Like, yes you know I'm, I, I, this is a little uncomfortable here it is it, it, yes and, and then you're backstage and you can't wipe your hands enough <laughs> right, right and, and right, it's just right. because the person in front of you just right completely nailed their performance mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because every pianist I've ever known, they all say the same thing. I'm so glad to be done with the competitions. And, uh, I, and yes, I think that's, those are that tough. is yeah. just, yeah. And, yeah. and that's something I never even was interested in. I right. never went down that road because yeah. I thought, 
I don't have the nerve for that. Mm. But I'll go and support my other, right? You know, students that mm -hmm. that compete mm -hmm. at this thing because mm -hmm. you need everyone in the world there to pat you on the back, yeah, just to get you out there. You know, that's a you, that's a massive topic. The whole issue of competitions. I did a lot of competing in my, and I've had students do a lot of competing. And I, um, but it's it's kind of a dangerous thing. You know, it's dangerous. It's it can be very demotivational. Oh, it can to say be the demon. Least. Uh, yeah, uh, just yeah. demotivating yeah. in yeah. your head. It's yeah. like I am yeah. never playing the game yeah. again right. in my life. No, that's that's and and these are people that are really really passionate about it. And um, I think there, I think what it is is just what with any tool, you can a tool can just get. A, there's a balance, right? There's a balance where it's useful, and there's a balance where it becomes destructive you know right. and i think that um you know it, it's very easy for it to become destructive we're about to have, have a big competition here in san antonio generally the, the gerwitz competition by the time the gerwitz is here you know the people that are performing in that are kind of have been through a lot of that stuff in their lives and they're kind of like i know what i'm doing i'm solid i'm Focused. out there performing right but in the high school years and the it can be it can be very, really really uh, challenging now we do them i believe in them it's just that they have to be Given the dosage has to be, uh, they're 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 a medicine for the right moment, right, right, and for the right student where they are, and it can be very destructive applied in the wrong place. And the problem is sometimes you don't know, right. you know, sometimes you don't know until you try it, right, and then you're like, you know, uh, then then it's um, then you realize. But then if you have a supportive environment, you can come away with that and understand, hey, this one this wasn't for me right now, you know. So a lot of times students go out of the competition and said. It was my first one, and I didn't do very good, but I really had a lot of fun. And, right. I, and I know what they're about, and I'm going to be ready for the next mm -hmm. one. That's when you get those emerging young artists that get right. fired up and they get focused. Right. And, you know, they right. imagine themselves in a year mm -hmm. from now doing this and mm -hmm. having a trophy with a check right. or at least right. a scholarship right. or something. Sure, and, sure, sure. and that sometimes is all it takes, just a little bit of a fuse to get someone fired up. Right, right. Off the top of your head, do yeah. you know amongst your, your piano students are – all of your students on acoustic instruments, or you think maybe, or you know, half, 38, 30% are well, that's digital. A, that's a good question. And, and a, a lot of that, I'm sure, yeah. goes with the age yeah. and the yeah. level of the students. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious. To right. You know, that was one of those things about the pandemic that was super revealing is, you know, we're doing lessons in their homes uh, online, right? And we were finding out, oh, this person's playing on an instrument that's this big and doesn't have a pedal and doesn't have, you know, uh, and, and it's like almost in the middle of the driveway or something. I'm right. kind of exaggerating, but it's like it's not in the right spot. Um, and then some people have gorgeous instruments. Um, I don't know exactly that, the answer to that question, but I think most people are starting with digitals these days, uh, less expensive digitals, right. and then uh, upgrading. And I do think with the fact that people move a lot, I mean, the digitals that are out there now, like there's, there's a hybrid right there that is an awesome instrument, you know, that um, you know has a lot of convenience moving wise, you know, uh, right. which is which is a, an issue these days. Um, people, you know, uh, moving a concert especially a military town, right? Especially a military town, exactly. So um, I, it's hard to it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Um, we encourage we we always um, when we're screening students when they're just coming in as beginners, uh, in particular, we make sure they have something with weighted keys and a pedal and you know full size keyboard at the very at the very least because if they don't have that then they're basically deciding that they're going to fail right away. I mean, you know, they're just, I'm going to take these lessons and I'm going to fail. And, and, there's, and so they have to have a, the bare minimum 88 weighted keys and a pedal, you know, to, to start, you know. So. I, I, I've got to back up and ask some personal journey. Yeah, but sure. What age did you start piano? What oh. was your first piano? Oh, that's a brilliant. And <laughs> when, wait, this is the other, I ask everyone this. Yeah, this eventually. Good. I thought, yeah. don't forget the basics. Yeah, yeah. How old were you when uh -huh. you started? Right. What was the first piano and what right. age where you realized, hey, I can do this? Oh, that's, those are great. Okay. My, I was, uh, my first piano was a piano my mom bought at an auction for $50, an upright that had been in a bar somewhere that was painted, uh, I think it was beige, painted beige. And, um, uh, and we eventually kept that piano outside on the porch. Um, and I was 13 years old when I started. And I was about uh, nine months into lessons where I was like, okay, I want to be a concert pianist. This makes sense. Yeah, yeah. because uh, there was a, I had an experience that I can share if you're open. Go to right okay, ahead. Okay. I love to hear it. There's so, always something tied. Well, well I, <laughs> first of all, the reason I started at 13, I had tried some other instruments. I never remembered how to... Um, I never could recall 
Um, I mean, I tried guitar, I tried drums. Well, I actually wanted to try drums. My parents didn't want me to try drums. But trumpet, accordion, a bunch of other things. Um, but, but, uh, and we had this old piano, you know, that I would mess around on some, just like, but I didn't know what I was doing. So um, I was a juggler then. Um, I was uh, juggled in a juggling troupe, and they would play ragtime um, along with Christ, us. Yeah. So I got that kind of ragtime. My grandmother also was a uh, performer in um, silent movies, and my dad was a rock and roll musician uh, and wrote songs and stuff like that. Anyway, so um, I had um, the juggling kind of, I was, I was playing the washboard and kazoo, uh, which was not very, you know, you know right. challenging. Um, it was uh, it wasn't acoustic kazoo though. Okay, it wasn't digital kazoo. Um, but anyway, they uh, it wasn't a Steinway kazoo. Um, but um, and then um, I also my grandmother had taught me these pieces like on on their old piano, and for some reason it just like obsessed me. I'm not sure why. It was like I was playing that little song that she taught me. I can't even remember what it was. And then the the kicker was with along with that is I, there was this girl that I liked who played the piano. So I was like, okay, I can if I play the piano, I will be able to talk to this girl and you know have something in common, right? So that all linked together, and I happened to down uh, literally a block from my house was a, an excellent first teacher, and I, I that was pure blessing. Happened to you know my next door neighbor was studying with her. I called out, called her, started lessons, and just really got into it, like just crazy. And then when I, um, I was, my um, dad used to play recordings of classical music on Sundays when we'd have uh, Sunday morning breakfast and whatnot, whatnot. And I never really liked it very much. But I, I took a record and put it on uh, this record of the Moonlight Sonata by uh, Arda Rubinstein playing. And when I got to the third movement, this is when I was cleaning my room, I was just shocked. I was like, this is amazing. I didn't know you could do this on a, on a piano. Like it just blew my little 13 year old mind completely. And I was like, I want to do that. And I started practicing then like a fiend. I, um, cause I was late as a starter, right? I was 13 and I was like, okay, I think most kids are probably, maybe if they're, if they're serious, they may be doing an hour and a half, an hour a day. I'll do double that. I'll do double what my teacher tells me. I will, um, whatever she says, I will fix, you know, the next week. And I, I just became this crazed Perfect practicer. Student. Yeah. And I just, kill, I just killed it from then on. I started competing and doing all this kind of stuff. And then I switched to the advanced teacher in Atlanta where I grew up. And then from there, went to Eastman and everything. So yeah, so that was, that was how I got started. So An you, old piano. So it was, it was not the ideal situation right? by right. a long shot. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And so um, when you first opened up the school mm -hmm. and you had, I think, just a handful of teachers. Right, right like five or six. Yeah. Um, how long was it before you realized, I don't have enough teachers, I need to get another oh, teacher? Oh, yeah, that's in, a good in, question. In, in the growth, I mean, because <laughs> if I remember right, there was kind of like an exponential growth here where... Yeah, yeah, know. yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we opened and I had this secret list of, of excellent teachers um, that I may have mentioned before. And um, many of them came, which I was very grateful for. And um, I, you know, I spent seven years working on a business plan and trying to get this going. And I knew when we opened, I, th I thought, I knew you're going to do this business plan and it's going to be completely different once you're running it. Like it's going to be, but, but at least when you do a business plan, you've worked through some of the questions and issues that might come up. And then you, then you face reality and you're like, oh, right. this, is, this is different. So it took a really long time to, um, to get to where it really started like really taking off. It felt, it felt like to me. Now on the outside, it may have looked may have looked um, like we were growing fast, but to me it took, you know, four, four years, you know, four, four years or so. Now, four years, looking back now, that uh, back on 24 years doesn't seem very long. No. But when you're living the four years, <laughs> it's miserable. It's Especially long. it's the first four years. <laughs> it's the first four years, Because yeah. those are all growing things. Right, right, yeah. So I would say about, about four or five years in, and then we had the opportunity to take over that second school, Brook Hollow, and... Um, that was a that was a real learning experience too. I mean, that, in a sense, I'm still learning from that, and that's been like 12 or 13 years. And ago. so you acquired yeah. what another large group. Yeah, of there, there, were, there was a, com a comp competitor uh, in San Antonio, and um, they had a large school and uh, doing very very well. But they were in a position where they wanted to retire, and um, they reached out to me actually. So I, I was actually going to open. I was working on a second location. 
already when they reached out to me. And then, and then once they did, I thought, well, let's go for this. I, um, you know, decided not to do that second location. You know what I mean? About they were the second location. Gotcha. Course, yeah. Gotcha. And they were they were very nice, and um, I'm very grateful uh, that I got that opportunity. It was just, it's just very challenging. I learned, in retrospect, um, organizations have a personality. They have a, a DNA, and uh, it can be difficult to take two different, or they have a culture uh, as well. To combine two cultures can really be. It's way harder than I thought. It, right. It's way harder. Different yeah. philosophies. Right. Right. Same goal. Right. That's right. Philosophy. That's right. Same goal. This yeah. is like you know when you get this offensive coordinator and this defensive mm -hmm. coordinator right. in a football team, and right. they got the same goal, but right. these two guys just can't seem to get a key right. point right. Right. between right. the right. two of them. Right. And right. that's the story of pro football because mm -hmm. they, 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 there's not always a right. lot of uh, um, it, you know understanding between mm -hmm. the two approaches, mm -hmm. and, and are just mm -hmm. like where the, they were before and where they're right. going to in the future. Right. But um, from a distance, and this is something that I learned um, years and years ago when I was in the banking uh, business in, in mm -hmm. New York City, is the sign of um, a great you know manager or, mm -hmm. or operator or whatever you want is is not how things are there when they're there. It's how mm -hmm. the business operates when they're not around. Oh, that's true. And yes. the one thing that I always noticed that after a couple of years is like, man, that can't open up the store to his school. And it's pretty cool that he does. He's not there all the time. I'm not the there. The guy no. is there doing it. I mean, and then I thought, yeah. you know, this guy had a plan mm -hmm. to open up something that was thoroughly thought out. And I remember mm -hmm. it being planned. And I thought, and if he plays his cards right, mm -hmm. he's going to be able to get himself into a spot where he'll just be very comfortable to be able to assist everyone mm -hmm. that's in his organization without having people pounding on him all the time. Right. And, right. and have some a lot of control over his own time. To me, right. that that's pure genius. And that, that just speaks volume. I mean, mm -hmm. for that, my admiration, I've seen well, people you. start businesses and I've seen <laughs> um, them go 23 hours a day right, for, sure. for eight, nine months right. and, then, and then have it just wipe them out, mm -hmm. either health or you right, know, they, they, they've got to take a sabbatical yeah. and they leave it to yeah. someone and they come back and it's mm -hmm. either better or worse. Mm -hmm. It's never the same. Mm -hmm. uh, for that, I really, really commend you on just your, your operating management, your mentality and the plan that you've had. Well, for your you. musical yeah. arts center in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I still think it's funny when you came in there. I just wanted to give you everything. Well, that, that, sounds, that like, sounds cool to me. I'm still but I know. That, that was, oh, this is going to be so easy. All we got to do is give them nine pianos. Uh, and then, yeah. you know, somewhere down the line, we'll figure out how, how they're yeah. going to get paid for it. Right. And, and then I remember the one thing, and as I told you this, as an ex-banker, Mm -hmm. I was a bank who said, no, nah, I'm not going to commit to anything. I'm not taking on any liability. Mm -hmm. I got to do this with clean hands. And I thought, right. And I remember I told you, good luck. That's going to be a tough. It is possible. Yeah. But it's it's a it's a tough, tough gig. It's tough to, yeah. to work for. It's it's harder for someone to go into business that way. But look at you now. You're a hell of a lot more successful mm -hmm. from it. And I'm so glad that your school is, is just blossoming. Well, it thank, has been. It's doing you. great. And uh, with that, this has been a visit and a tour of the Musical Arts Center of San Antonio with Ken Thompson. It's kind Thank of so much, like his, <laughs> this has been a wonderful visit. And we're going to have another follow-up video here where we're going to get into talking details about teaching and a philosophy of mm -hmm. teaching. And then it's kind of like, what is the method? Mm -hmm. Because I always thought that, well, I'm not much of a teacher. I could just mm -hmm. coach someone. And mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't want to be responsible for their lack of learning something because right. I didn't know about right. it. Right. And that's one reason why I've never wanted to teach <laughs> anyone. It's like, I don't want to make anyone... Like I am. I want to better off and smarter. Right. Right. And so we will be back with another video where Ken's going to extrapolate a little bit on the teaching methods used here at, at Maxa. And Ken, thank you so well, much. Thank you it's so just much, been Dad. a wonderful Pleasure. conversation yeah. and, and tour of your facility. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank gotcha. you. This is Ted Barcelou for Alamo Piano Galleries. Thanking you for listening to this conversation with Ken Thompson out here at Maxa, and we will be back soon and look mm -hmm. for you in the future at alamopianogalleries.com and subscribe to our channel. We'll look for you here on YouTube.